Anglická klávesnica funguje veľmi dobre, pokiaľ píšete po anglicky, ale ako náhle chcem napísať moje priezvisko, ktoré je šedivý s mechčením na š a s dlžením na y, tak potrebujem slovenskú klávesnicu. Slovenská klávesnica nie je kverty, je kverc. Uh, hore čísla sa robia so shiftom a vpravo uh, sa tam tiež kadečo pomení. Takže pre programovanie to nie je príliš hodné, no ale keď chce človek písať po slovensky, tak to inak nejde. Wer will auf Deutsch schreiben und braucht ein paar Umleute, also A, O, U mit zwei Punkten und dann scharfes S, groß, klein. Wer von euch, der mich jetzt gerade versteht, weiß, dass es auch das große scharfe S gibt. Das kriegt ihr auf der deutschen Tastatur nicht hin. Nur an die deutsche Tastatur, die sieht wieder ein bisschen anders aus. Also da oben sind äh, die Sachen ein bisschen anders, rechts ein bisschen anders und es ist Querz, genauso wie die slowakische Tastatur. Česká klávesnice se podobá slovenské klávesnici, taký kverc, ale má nejaké iné nabodeníčka, čárky, háčky ktoré, a úskrouškem, ktoré sa píše zase trošičku inak. Takže, když chcete programovať, tak to taky moc dobře nefunguje. No ale, ak chcete psať česky, tak je dobré e, mít českou klávesnici. Jeska kelka a deja ekri sur un klavier français? Se ni kverty, se ni kverc, se azerty? Le point, on le fait avec un shift, la M et le ailleurs, et tout le reste change. Mais si on veut écrire des CD, des accents circonflexes, tréma, etc., on a besoin d'un clavier français. Euh, moi, j'ai appris à utiliser le VI sur le clavier français, et à l'époque, je ne comprenais pas comment quelqu'un a pu euh, construire ou bien développer un, un logiciel comme VI en utilisant le clavier français, parce que les deux ne vont pas du tout bien ensemble. Teclado Castellano. Se necesitáis escribir un poco en castellano con n puntos de uh, interrogación o de exclamación abiertos al principio de una frase, necesitáis el teclado castellano, que no es muy práctico para la programación. Jak to už písal po polsku, chce napísať do kogož, do šena živa, Grzegorz Brženči Šikievič, že mieška v Šonči, že vošice poviat venkovody, tak je fajné mieniť polskom klaviatúre, ktorá, ktorá je bardzo podobná do amerikánskej, no ale ak chcete písať akéž kropky, kresky, iné znaky, tak je vážne, je možlivé jakouž kombináciou písať tak na polskej klaviatúre. La tastiera italiana je abbastanza semplice, eh, con la differenza che è abbastanza difficile di de, de scrivere le lettere accentuate maiuscole, che non, non ci sono e non si può scrivere. Per programmare no, non funziona uh, bene. Eh, po svenska, anvender ma ame dring, o magyar abc ben kettes eles e kezettel alhato is, Kvankam Esperanto estas tre internacia lingvo, ankvau estas uh, kelkai tre speciale literoi, Ve Türkçe de büçük noktalı i ve küçük noktasis ivar. And we have only scratched the surface. So now you imagine you want to type in a few European languages and your keyboard layout looks like that. So most letters, characters are on the, always on the same place, but all these points, question marks, braces, brackets, um, quotation marks, and everything is moving all around. So if you want to switch between keyboard layouts and uh, use uh, different uh, languages. It is really almost impossible to, to remember where which programming uh, keys uh, are available. And what you see, uh, all these letters are, uh, at, you can type them directly or with shift. And there are many keyboard layouts where you have to use the right alt to reach uh, for some other characters. So this is uh, really a chaos if you want to use that. So how can you type in different languages? Uh, using character maps, okay, from time to time you can always search for some letter, but when you are typing fluently in a language, this is not an option either. Fortunately, there was a compose key in the 80s on some IBM keyboards and other uh, manufacturers. They put a compose key on the mm, on their keyboard. And compose key, how it works, it is sequentially, so you don't have just to play piano, you, ha you can type uh, it sequentially, you just type compose key and then combination of two or three other characters that are really easy to remember, and then it uh, gives you the character you want. So, for example, here in this example, you see if I want to type uh, accent aigu, so like acute accent, I uh, type uh, compose, simple quote, because simple quote looks like uh, acute accent, and uh, then the letter, for example, A, for the long check A. Um, if you want to type a German umlauts, uh, double quotes is actually the umlaut, so compose, umlaut, and then A, O, or U, capital, or uppercase, or lowercase. And 
the, the concept is not language dependent. So if you want to type in French, for example, the name of the car manufacturer, Citroën, this is the A with Trema, but the Trema is the same like Umlaut in German. So you just remember anything that looks like two dots, I need compose, double quotes, and then the character. Um, if you type in Polish, the W, this is the, um, uh, the slash through L, it is compose slash L. Um, the German Schaf SS, Compose SS. If you need the uppercase Schaf SS, it's Compose Shift S, Shift S. And it allows you also to type many, many, many more uh, characters that you need uh, every day. For example, three dots, uh, ellipses, it is Compose dot dot. And then copyright, uh, registration mark, the Spanish uh, turned uh, question marks and uh, exclamation marks, and many, many other characters. This is something that you don't have to implement yourself. It is in your system. You just check this file, maybe in your system it is at some other place, and this is a file that defines all the combinations you can use uh, with your Compose key. So, for, and this file contains over 6,000 lines. So if you uh, just check and see the characters you need to type every day, you will see that the combination, they are really very easy to remember. Um, if you want to add uh, even your own combinations, like you have some other special characters that are not included, you have some emojis or some other more characters, you can define your own .xcombos uh, file directly in your home directory, and then you can define your own combinations that will be automatically uh, taken into account. So now we know that there is a Compose key, we know how it works, we know where to define all the KIMP mappings, but we still need the Compose key because your modern keyboard layouts probably don't contain them. And this is the XKB map uh, in your operating system that allows you to, uh, to define, to remap uh, some other keys. And exactly in this file, you have all the possibilities, all the list of all keys that you can map to Compose. So it is Compose, colon, and then, for example, write Alt, or write control key or print screen. If you are using modern uh, ThinkPad, uh, there is a print screen really at very good reach. Uh, I prefer on uh, modern keyboards uh, to use uh, menu or the right Windows key. So you can uh, just tell set XKB map US and the options are your compose is for example the menu key or anything else. Okay, so now we have uh, already hacked a little bit our keyboard, but we can do now something more. And there is other key that we may remap, probably. Which one is it? Yeah, who needs caps lock anyway? So what can we do with caps lock? There is, for example, what, what, because a caps lock is something that you can reach with your pinky uh, finger very well, very easily. So maybe we can take control and remap our caps lock to control. So there is a line that tells, okay, my caps lock is now a control modifier. And then I can tell I want my compose key is on the menu and my caps lock works as a control key. Okay, so this is good start, but why should we have only one per, uh, extra control key? when we can map another key on the same caps lock. What is the difference between escape and control? If I hold and touch and hold uh, the control key, then I want to touch something else, it is control. But if I just hit it alone, it is escape. And in VI editor, you need escape all the time. So you can just tell, okay, my, my caps lock is control when I combine it with something else, or it is escape when I don't combine it, when I hit it alone. And then, you can just take the program, for example, Xscape that will follow, that will watch your caps lock and wait if you release it without touching anything else, it will be Escape, otherwise it will be the control. And this way, we have really our ultimate keyboard layout, which is standard US one, with only two keys modified that will allow you to work with the VI much faster and also to type in uh, most European languages without touching anything else. So if you don't, if you want to use some Kolemak or Dvorak or some other keyboard layout, someone else at your computer will have problems with this. No, 
because nobody will usually touch control or uh, menu or right window key and you with your remaps uh, you have the possibility to reach uh, much much further and you just need to type these two uh, commands into your into your init, init files and then it works perfectly well so now we can we are ready to rock or better to say to vim and we are going to check to see a little bit of history of vim the whole history starts end of 60s beginning of 70s so probably the times before most of you here were born um, in this uh, chronology of uh, via editor you probably know vim that starts in 91 it is the open source uh, editor uh, fork of uh, vi or the whole rewrite of the vi editor uh, written by uh, the dutch uh, programmer bram molinar and it is something that works until now and now vim is in the version 8 um, there is NeoVim, quite new, 2014, and it's a more community-driven fork of uh, Vim with uh, some improvements that we are going to see later. Um, around Vim you see Stevie and Elvis. These were Amiga or other operating system clones that uh, Vim was based on. And then the history goes a little bit further back, 76, the VI editor, the standard VI editor on Unixes. And even before that there is Ed. Anyone has already seen Ed, heard of Ed, used Ed, using it every day? No. You will see that you are missing something, because it is the most useful editor you can have on your computer. Who knows these two guys? Dennis Ricci, Ken Thompson. They are the authors of Unix. Without these two guys, no Unix, no BSD, no Linux, no Mac OS, no Android, just Windows everywhere. And these two guys uh, wrote the Linux operating system in the 70s, beginning of 70s. And what you see, this, th this computer they are sitting in front of, the big box in the background, it is the PDP-11. And the interface are these two tables in front of them. This is the ASR-33. What you see on these tables, there is a keyboard, and there is a printer, a printer with infinite or very long roll of paper. There is no display. And this is the way how terminal worked. You could type in your comment. You can see it immediately as a printed line on the printer. It was sent to the computer, to the main computer, to the PDP-11 with the operating system. PDP-11 sent, the, oops, sorry, sent the answer back and it printed just more lines and it was the only way how the computers could communicate with you and this was linear so it is like a communication i tell something the computer tells something and the printer it cannot really edit the paper it can just print always new characters scroll and uh, print new characters and this is how they wrote the whole unix operating system now imagine how we want to program something on such a computer, on such a typing machine. If you cannot type the whole program at once, maybe you could, you are PHP coders, but in those times they had to write something, then edit it, then delete some parts, rewrite, and for that you need an editor that communicates serially. And this is where Ed Editor was born, and it, a session with Ed Editor looks a little bit like this. Check your computers, Ed is very probably installed there. If you have a server, it is there. It is uh, the most practical, not the most practical, the most ubiquitous uh, text editor available because it communicates serially. It means if on your computer everything is broken, display, mouse, everything is broken, you can still somehow edit in it because you just type comments, edit answer something and you can program it. So if we um, just now start an edit session, um, if I want to edit something, I cannot tell, okay, now I'm editing something, I'm just writing the whole code, and at the end I'm going to save, because there is no menu, no shortcuts, nothing. Uh, I have to use it in comments. So at the beginning I start add, and then I with A I say append, I want to append new lines to my file. And then I write two lines with hello world and everyone at phpce. And with dot on the empty line, I uh, and the text that uh, the text edition that uh, I was doing now. Then there is 2P. 
2 is the address, it is the number of the line, and P printed. And what you see in yellow, with the yellow background, this is what the computer answers. So the computer tells me, okay, this is the second line of your file, and it prints it. And then I say, add a new line, add A, uh, and then I say, okay, how are you doing today? Um, how are you today? With the dot is the end. And then I want to see everything. And then I do uh, percent %n. Percent tells me, give me the whole file, and n print it, but with the numbers of, li of lines. And I see one, two, three, and my whole code, my whole text. The next command is change, replace in the line two, replace world, the word world, uh, with the word um, phpc um, 18. And uh, 3d means delete the third line. And then um, percent %n and print the whole file again. So now you imagine that you are typing the whole source code of uh, the whole Unix operating system. You don't want to type the whole uh, hundreds of thousands uh, lines uh, of your source code. You can, but then you need a lot of paper. Um, so you can just tell, give me just the lines from number to number, or give me just the lines that match some regular expression. And this is where the comment grep was born. Grep, G-R-E-P, that you use to find, uh, to search in the contents of uh, files, comes from here. G-R-E-P is an abbreviation of G, like global comment, R-E is a regular expression, and P is the add comment to print something. This is, this is not an English word, grep is actually uh, an abbreviation of uh, some usage of add. So at the end, uh, we write uh, everything into filetest.txt. It writes the number of file of uh, bytes, and then quit, finished, and it's over. And this is how you can type uh, on in add. You, the, if you, for example, if you um, use a VI and you edit your vimrc to the extent that your vimrc doesn't work anymore, you cannot use vim to fix your vimrc. So you need some other editor that always works. And since add is independent from anything, it works really on, on anything, um, it can always edit your files because there is no add RC. But we are going to see how not to scramble your vimrc to the extent that you couldn't use it anymore. But we are going to see it later. So this is how everyone was editing their text at the beginning of 70s. And then came ADM3A terminal with a nice screen that could be used to edit files a little bit more interactively. And this is where VI was born in 76 by Bill Joy. Um, this is the whole keyboard, so you see no F uh, keys, you see no, no arrows, uh, no uh, numerical pad. To the left, to the A, you see the control key, and just next to it you see escape. Both of them are very well reachable. This is why I wanted to have them at my reach, because it is only on the modern keyboards that uh, escape and control are so far away. These are two very important keys that you need the whole time, and this is fine to have them uh, at your reach. And if you have ever used uh, VI or heard about it, you have heard like they have no arrows, they are using this HJKL, and you see the arrow keys on, of AJKL, and this is exactly the equivalent. So with AJKL you could just move around your file, and uh, this is where it comes from. But why is it exactly there? Why is it in that combination of AJKL? This is from the ASCII um, control characters. If we imagine the ASCII table from 0 to 225, 32 is, zero, uh, is space, and then there are some letters characters, uh, special characters like programming, like braces, brackets, uh, slashes, and so on. But there is also a world under 32. So if you have ASCII codes of 0 to 31, they mean something. And there, there are, for example, the number uh, cert no, 13. Um, line feed is uh, 10. Like ASCII character 10 is the enter. So you have enter for that. Uh, you have tab on your uh, keyboard. You have escape. But most other characters, you don't have them. But there must be, must be a way to type them in your computer. And this is where the control key comes from. These are control characters. We have control key. What does control key? Control key, if you hold it and press something else, it take the, takes the ASCII code of that character, subtracts 64, and returns it. So for example, if you see the number 10 is line feed, 
and uh, next to the number 10 there is uh, carrot j. So if you do control j, it takes the, the ASCII uh, value of j is uh, 74, it subtracts the uh, 64, so we have 10, and it sends the ASCII code of 10. And this is how you can uh, do all other characters. So maybe you have, in, if in terminal you happen to type control S, then you can type and it will send nothing. We have to type control key again, Q, control Q again. So now let's have a look. Control S is transmit off and control Q is transmit on. We are just sending control characters. Um, something else that you probably know is uh, control Z. Z is. Uh, uh, substitution, so you just substitute the process and you stop the process that is uh, running and you come back to the to the shell. Is there anything else that you probably know? Ah, control M, number 13, carriage return. If on uh, Unix or Linux you happen to open a uh, Windows file, you will see at the end of new lines you will see like carriage M. This is the carriage return from Windows that is not a control character in Linux and this is how it gets uh, that information. So. We have seen that control J is line feed, so my J in VI goes down, like line feed goes down. Uh, there is uh, control H, control H is backspace, so to the left. And the other two characters, control K and L, were just at the good position next to it. Control K is vertical tab, control L is form feed. Um, they don't mean the same like, like the arrows, but uh, they are at the right position. Um, by the way, form feed, control L, if you do it in your terminal, it will just clear the terminal output. And control L is form feed. Form feed on a printer means just take the whole form, take it, put the paper on, and start with a new sheet of paper. It was an infinite paper, but um, it uh, just moves uh, the whole uh, sheet uh, up. Now you see that text editing is just manipulating text and you can do everything with the bytes that you are sending to your uh, computer and you don't really need a mouse because using a mouse is like pointing and grunting to get your point across but with Vim you can speak in full sentences it's much more beautiful where it comes from in VI every key on your keyboard has some function so if you are not typing new text, entering new text, you are in the um, in the command mode. Uh, you can use uh, most keys or combinations of them to do everything with your text. You are you are the author. You are the hacker of the text, and you can manipulate it programmatically. So you just say, I don't want to take mouse and find for some character. I just want to go two lines down, three words right, uh, then find um, occurrence of some other uh, word, and then do something with it. And these AJKL are not the only movements, maybe you start with them, but then AJKL is just the, in the middle of your movement, of your movement tool. And with knowledge of a few more commands, you can really jump around very quickly around the whole text and do anything you need. So this system is so perfect that there, uh, it inspired many other programs. This Vim-like software. Um, there is a lot of other software that uses similar keys for the manipulation, for, for movement between objects, um, for searching and uh, also the concept of modes. So for example in Shell there is Bash and Z Shell where you can um, type uh, or use uh, Vim commands to move around uh, the commands you are typing. Then there is i3 and Tmux, these are window managers, text window managers. Um, i3, this is what I'm using, it's a window, uh, window manager in Linux that uh, ha doesn't have uh, win small windows, moving windows, but uh, is, uses the whole screen and with keyboard I can just move around or, or tile the, the objects on the screen. There is an asterisk next to i3. Um, i3 um, authors thought it would be cooler to use to, to, to shift my AJKL one to the right, so there is JKL and the fourth key, so you are on your home row and then you don't move to the left if you want to move around with AJKL, you just stand there. This is the first thing that I have always to reprogram, uh, reconfigure in i3. Otherwise, it's a very nice uh, piece of software. There are browsers, Qt browser is a web browser uh, only for keyboard. Uh, Vimperator, Vimium uh, or other are extensions of uh, Chromium or Firefox that um, allow you to move around uh, with keyboard only. 
Uh, for emails, there is MUT. For uh, RSS uh, reader, there is Newsboiter. Um, less if a pager, VIFM is a uh, file manager, Zatura PDF, uh, PDF uh, reader. Then there is a FE is an image viewer, VI Paint never used that, is an image editor, entirely in uh, VI logic. There are many, many other programs. But all the everything that I mentioned until now are different programs. So we have like like viewer, like browser, like file manager. So you are not editing text, you are doing something else. But if there is something that is similar to editing text, it just uses the same comments. But there are plenty of other text editors or full-blown uh, IDEs that have so-called VI mode. The problem of this VI mode is it works up to 95 to 98%. 98% means that every five or six minutes I happen to do something that works differently. So this is not what I expect to, to do. So that's why for all text editing stuff uh, I'm using VI. It is not easy to, to learn uh, all the stuff uh, about VI, but this is something that as a text editing uh, ability is something that for us uh, uh, software developers or people generally in IT is something that we should uh, master uh, perfectly well because it's our daily job to do something with text. And if I want to know whether it is worth the time to master something to the extent that um, I spare every time I do something, I spare uh, some time, I go to XKCD and then I see, okay, how often do I need to spare some time? How much time do I spare? And then I see that actually I can invest my whole life in learning uh, such things because it will help me to enjoy my tools and uh, to be uh, more effective uh, in my work every day. Because there is also some other activity that hopefully, probably, most of you are not doing every day or so much like text editing, it is driving a car. So how, imagine how much time and energy and money you invested in driving a car, and then you see, okay, I can drive a car, and any car I sit in, it works just the same, so I can, I'm the same, my efficiency, my ability to drive uh, is the same on every car, until you change them from time to time, and see that if you use different cars that, for example, for the reverse gear or for the climatization, air conditioning, you have to see that in every car it is a little bit different. But it's using, using car is something that you have to learn. Using a good text editor is something that you have to learn. And how can you learn it? You can just try, uh, try out. You can Google if you have any problems. You can ask at Stack Overflow. The most popular question at Stack Overflow is how do I quit VI? Okay, it's not funny anymore. But if you use a, com a software tool more than one hour a day, read a book about it. Because the author of a book has concepts, knows the concepts of the program and can show you how it should be used and what, what thought had the author of the program uh, as uh, they developed it. And for VI, I can absolutely recommend author Trunil. He wrote Practical VM a few years ago. Uh, this is a book that was valid 20 years ago that will be valid in 20 years. This is really the, the core VI or Vim uh, with all the functions without any extensions. That and In the book you will learn that, oh, I want to do something, then I have to think like in VI and manipulate it with the text objects in a way that uh, it is the most uh, efficient. Uh, the other book is Modern Vim. Uh, it is less than one year old. Um, and it is more uh, concentrated on, um, more, more designed for uh, using VI as a real IDE. And this is this book, I'm one of the technical reviewers. I can absolutely recommend it, but it's a book that in a few years will become already obsolete because there will be new extensions that will allow you to do the stuff better or differently. And uh, Junel is also author of Vimcasts. There are about 70 or 80 short videos uh, that uh, explain how to do uh, stuff uh, in VI very efficiently. Until now, I was speaking about Vim or NeoVim sometimes. What is the difference? Uh, NeoVim is a fork of Vim 7.4, about four years ago. Um, and it's more community driven. So the authors of NeoVim uh, are much faster and more open to accept the new contributions, but they always try to be 100% uh, compatible with Vim. The only difference I know is in Vim 8, you can start the comment smile, so colon smile, it will smile 
in NeoVim, this improvement has been rejected. I don't know why. Um, NeoVim is first before Vim 8, because Vim 8 now supports this as well, is asynchronously. It means that your um, programs or extensions that need more time, like linting, testing, some communication with uh, over the net um, network, um, that are slow and would um, block your work, they run asynchronously, so you can go on, continue, and when the result is available, it will just show up. Uh, there is terminal, built-in terminal, so you can communicate with the results of, uh, uh, of uh, pro other processes uh, much easier. Actually, VI is Unix uh, software, so it follows the Unix, uh, uh, Unix way or Unix philosophy, and it communicates with uh, other processes uh, very well. There are modern defaults in NeoVim, and it runs only on modern systems, so some older systems have been abandoned in NeoVim, which saves a lot of uh, code base. Um, the configurations are somewhere else, and the greatest extension is that it is extendable. And it is extendable in an open way, so the plugins, they don't have to be written in Vim script anymore, they can be written in other programming languages. So in the programming languages of your choice, you can write better, um, better piece of software that will communicate with your Vim and use it as a plugin. If you want to Vim your PHP, Vim offers everything that probably that you need. Uh, syntax highlighting, indenting, auto-completion, then some linting, uh, communication with Git, like live uh, Git diff uh, in the current file, and also manipulation with your uh, Git objects. Uh, then searching uh, quickly on all files or, or with a fuzzy searcher. Uh, there are snippets for some piece of codes if you are typing in using programming language that needs these snippets where you have to type or generate a lot of code. Um, there is folding, like automatically hiding in content of uh, functions that and you will see then only the first line. Uh, interaction with terminal, as I mentioned before, and there is spell checking that checks just comments and strings. So the names of the functions can be uh, anything you, you need. Um, on the other way around, I thought PHP or Vim should be possible. And then I checked the list of programming languages that are currently supported in this remote communication and PHP is not there. I'm sorry for that. So if you have, if you use also some other programming language like Python or Node.js or C, C++, C Sharp, then you can write yourself a plugin for Vim, but now I don't know about the possibility to, tie, to write your plugin in PHP. But it shouldn't be a problem to write an infrastructure for that. So if anyone raises a hand, can start with that, and uh, certainly the community would welcome it. Um, if you want to customize your Vim, it's possible, but you should master the standard NeoVim or Vim uh, without customization. Uh, because uh, Vim is everywhere, you log on some server, there is Vim, but it's not your Vim, so it works in the standard way. And this is exactly what you could see in the book uh, of uh, Practical Vim, is the usage of Vim in the standard way, without uh, any extensions. So, it is a good way to learn standard Vim, and then if you want to customize, of course, if you are on your own computer, um, you want to have it uh, the most uh, efficient uh, possible. In the beginning, you would always reach for the arrow keys. You can deactivate them easily, and then it won't work. If there is a colleague who wants to see something in your text file and then uh, touches the um, arrows, uh, it will not move around. But that's the best way to learn it. So after a few weeks or months, you are really forced to use AJKL or other keys for movement that are much uh, more efficient. You can remap keys, but remapping keys means that then the key doesn't do something, it do, does something else. So you are losing some functionality. You can always shorten some comments. If you have a longer comment that does something, you can shorter it to a sh like remap it to a shorter one, that's fine. Appearance, of course, with all the um, uh, color, um, the usage of some, some headers, footers, uh, gutters on the side, uh, this is always uh, useful. Behavior and okay, how, how it behaves and plugins. And there are plenty of plugins. I'm not going to read them here because if you want to customize it and to use some plugin, you should read about it. 
uh, you may of course you may ask someone uh, search for some some comments online but you shouldn't take just a bunch of plugins from someone a whole vmrc and then use it just every time you take a new line into your vmrc just consider it see okay do i need it and uh, then edit only then because you shouldn't put any lines into your vmrc that you don't understand and vmrc is a dot file a dot file is file somewhere in your home directory with dot at the beginning of it so a hidden file and the dot files, not only vimrc, but zshell rc, the mocks, some SSH configurations, and, and so on and so on, are your technical CV. Technical CV, it means it is something that you develop your whole life. You just take it with you, you don't have to show it to anyone, but if you change your companies, you change your computers, it is always good to have something that you are used to and you develop it through your career. Um, all these dot files, you, they are on your computer, they should be backed somewhere on the internet in a private GitLab repository or Ubaspace or uh, GitHub or somewhere else. You can, if you know that they are, there is nothing private in them, you can of course show them uh, to the public and let other people discuss um, them and also let other people inspi get inspiration from you if you comment them well. Um, this your choice, um, but it's uh, always a good idea to have your dot files at one place in one repository, and then git them, because if you have, um, if you just try out something new, and then your Vim doesn't start properly because you change something, you're not going to use Vim to re-edit that file, but in git you just started a new branch, committed, okay, it didn't work, so you just check out the original branch and uh, then it will uh, work again as uh, you were used to. With those branches it is also possible to uh, to try out new things or or even to, to run parallel environments that are similar but a little bit different. For example, at home I'm, I have my laptop, at work I have a laptop with two monitors. So the configuration, for example, of i3 with all the displays, with all the workspaces is a little bit different. So this is a small thing that changes between the two configurations. So you can just have them into branches and then cherry pick between the two. But most things uh, are stuff that you are taking with you and you want to have them um, at your disposal. How to do, how to organize your um, dot files? Um, I tried to have one dot file directory and then soft link uh, all other um, files to that but it was quite complicated there are some frameworks for that but this is a way that works really perfectly well i just aliased uh, my git to a new command named config and two things that i told it um, there is a git um, repository git dir not in my home directory and in dot git but in Dot, dot files. The difference is that if I am in my shell, in my home directory, and my shell wants to tell me something about the current uh, repository, it will, it would always have a look, ah, there is a dot git, so I have to compare all 10,000 files in my home directory with everything that is in my dot git, and actually for my dot files I want to version like 10 files. So from 10,000 files I want to have only these 10, fi these ten uh, files. Um, and it would Every time I do uh, enter in my shell, it would just compare it and tell me, okay, there is there are so many untracked files and so many changes, and it would take uh, too much time. So if I tell, okay, my git directory is not in dot git, but in dot dot files, and then I tell this uh, config that it's a git with uh, git directory in uh, dot files and with work tree in my home, I can use config as a complete as a working uh, git uh, command, but concerning all the files that I am tracking and that are tracked in my dot dot files. So I define this, then I initiate uh, these dot files as a bare uh, git uh, repository, and very important command is this uh, config local status show untracked files to no. It means that if I'm in my home directory and I say config status, status it will not compare 
tell me that there are 10,000 untracked files. It will just tell, okay, you are you have your 10 files that have been changed. I can div, I can branch, I can commit, I can do everything with that. Then I add some remote on GitLab, GitHub, or Ubespace, or any place you have. And then with um, config uh, add uh, uh, and adding other all files I need, I can just work it with with a, as, a, as with a git uh, repository. So, is it really one brain, one keyboard, one editor? So, is it really the way to be most efficient when using only one brain, one pair of hands, one physical keyboard, one logical keyboard, and one text editor to work every all stuff uh, with texts? Yes if you use your muscle memory, because this is something that you develop over your career. Um, if you use only one keyboard layout and you don't have to think I'm now typing in Polish, Slovak, French or English. And with a Compose key it works uh, very well. Um, use one editor for all text. It is not text, it is like programming, emails, configurations, slides, books, everything. Uh, you can use your programming uh, language of choice if it is not PHP, because PHP doesn't work with Vim now very well. Um, take the, your dot .files with you, and don't put uh, any lines into your uh, dot .files that you don't understand. And go back to the roots, so just accept that there is some Unix philosophy that works for this stuff very well. Because enjoying the tools is the most important part of your work. Thank you very much.